Okay, why don't we why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, want to welcome everyone to our uh, usual Thursday uh, noon research conference or 11:30 research conference, and um, I'm uh, delighted to uh, introduce our speaker today. I've over the last uh, month or two um, gotten to know um, Steve Shea, who is the director of what. Um, uh, old timers of you and me would call the Crowit, uh, which actually now has a new name, the Oregon Institute of Occupational Health Sciences. And um, uh, actually, uh, uh, Steve and I are, are part of this group that is um, uh, trying to uh, build this, establish this collaboration with a group in Thailand, uh, which, uh, as you may know, uh, things are a little. Um, uh, uh, unsettled uh, in, in Thailand. Uh, um, but anyway, um, as we got to know each other, we thought it would be useful uh, to cross-pollinate our uh, respective programs. So actually, you may have seen, it showed up in a few emails. Uh, uh, I gave a talk yesterday um, at their institute, and um, uh, uh, Steve is going to give a talk today. Um, and. Um, um, I'm, I'm hoping, um, I, I asked him to um, uh, try to talk about things that might um, uh, be of interest uh, um, as I've gotten to know his work and um, sleep and, and safety and, and a lot of it generates data. I, I see a number of touch points and so um, uh, hopefully going forward we might establish some uh, collaborations. Um, so Steve uh, is uh, currently a senior scientist, uh, director of the Oregon Institute for Occupational Health Sciences. He uh, holds a PhD in physiology uh, from the University of London, and he's actually been, though, in the United States for a number of years. Our, 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 we were actually in the same city for a brief period of time when I was finishing uh, my NLM fellowship in Boston uh, back in the late 80s, although I didn't know him then, and then I came here in 1990. Um, in the meantime, he uh, was on the faculty um, uh, at uh, Harvard Medical School, um, up through the rank of associate professor, and then, then um, uh, relocated here to um, head the institute formerly called Crowit. I'll always think of it as Crowit, but anyways. Uh, um, so he's going to uh, talk to us today about the uh, activities of of his um, center and, and the interesting work that, that he does. So I will turn it over to Steve. <clears throat> well, thanks very much, Bill. Um, do you know what CROIT stands for? Center for Research on Occupational and Environmental uh, Yeah, correct, yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, that's one of the reasons we had to change the name. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of people in our group do 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 environmental and occupational toxicology, but it didn't really reflect the whole breadth of what we do. And I'm going to sort of put the, my talk in two parts. One is to introduce the institute and, and, the, and some of the activities, research activities in the institute, and another is to talk about my own research. So uh, <clears throat> it's an amazing um, fact that the state of Oregon pays one sixteenth of one cent for every hour that you all work to us to um, to try and do, to meet this mission, to conduct basic and applied research, outreach and education to address Oregon's occupational health needs. That comes from the Workers' Compensation Fund. So we get, a, um, our institute gets a, just over $3 million a year to, to do that. We have about 16 faculty and about, um, about 50 or 60 people. But um, we also bring in other funds, um, um, most, uh, most of our funds actually come from NIH. We have about a budget of about eight or nine million million dollars a year. And it's a very eclectic center, I would say, um, trying to get to understand what they do. The main research areas, I'm, I've, I've segregated into f uh, five or six areas. One is called Total Worker Health. And this is um, Oregon Healthy Workforce Center is housed within our institute. It's um, uh, uh, one of four centers of excellence across the country, um, funded by NIOSH, and it develops tests and disseminates programs that integrate safety, health, and wellness to reduce injuries and improve health. So the idea there is if you, if you just focus on safety, you're ignoring health, and if you just focus on health, you ignore safety, and the two play off each other. You can imagine that if somebody concentrates on 
on their health, they go for a run every day, they're not going to really do too many unsafe practices at work. Uh, so they, they help each other, and that's the total worker health motif. And um, they're just putting a, a competitive renewal for that grant. Ken Anger is the director of that center. Uh, it's a great center. It really, I think, really does reflect uh, overall what, what our mission is. Um, just uh, along, the, along the lines of Croet, you know, the old Croet uh, occupational um, toxicology. Um, so here we, the exposure component. Uh, you have workers who are exposed to chemicals, pesticides, etc. And uh, this group characterizes the effects of occupational exposures, determines mechanisms, and develops interventions to reduce exposures and adverse consequences. And I, I should mention that we don't only work in Oregon uh, to complete this mission. As I said, a lot of the money comes from the NIH. We even have one uh, faculty member who's hardly ever here. He's mostly in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And um, he, he goes around there with a bodyguard doing his research, looking at people who, who have um, <clears throat> under-processed cassava roots, and they, they have to eat, eat these because they're hungry, uh, but they don't process them well enough, and they get uh, cyanide poisoning, which affects uh, the nervous system. And he, you know, he does genomics all the way through to interventions uh, in the community and education to, to try and prevent and help, help those people. Um, another group looks at strategies and solutions for vulnerable workers. So here, for instance, we have young workers, agricult agricultural workers, many of them uh, migrants, solitary workers um, who don't have the community uh, ethic. They don't have a wellness program at work, you know, things like that. And um, an example here is uh, somebody working on... Um, the summit, summit interns that come and look after the, um, life, you know, the lifeguards at the swimming pools um, over the summer who, um, you know, young people, <coughs> they don't think they're ever in danger and they'll do things which are more risky. And, and so uh, that's an a education and intervention program in, in that group. Um, and the, going back, and the solitary workers, truckers, is, an, is another group that we look at. Um, so injury treatment, recovery, and prevention, uh, we, we have a small group of people who are looking at n nerve regeneration after, a, for instance, a, la uh, a laceration injury, um, and um, an affiliate faculty member who looks at um, pain medication and opiate use um, and, and trying to see if that is used appropriately across Oregon. Um, there are a lot of deaths related to opiate use, and um, this is one of the problems of uh, workplace injuries or any injuries is the chronic use of, of pain medication. And then <clears throat> what I really came over to, to start up or grow anyway is um, the relationship of workers' health to sleep and shift work. So my research background is in sleep, sleep disorders, and circadian rhythms, and as that relates to shift work. So uh, what we're trying to do is build a program that will screen and, and treat sleep disorders in the workforce educate workforces about sleep health. I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that to improve sleep, safety, and productivity, and overall health. And <clears throat> along that theme, so if you think, if we, I think of this theme as sort of a, a vertical theme going from molecular and cellular research through animal lab research. I don't know if you can read that at the back, but then it goes human lab research, workplace interventions, education, dissemination, and outreach. And we have, um, in the sleep theme, we actually have some people you probably already know. Um, one person is, uh, in this realm is Chuck Allen. He's looking at how the circadian pacemaker works, looking at the neurophysiology within cells and within a network of cells, how they communicate and how they send signals to the rest of the body to organize our physiology and our behaviors. Um, he's been here for um, many, for I would imagine, like at least 15 years. Um, somebody who just arrived last year, um, from Harvard is Matthew Butler, new, new faculty member. He's not looking at the cells, but he's looking at the organs. He's looking at sort of shift work in animal models, um, so in mice. Um, and then I'm looking at shift work and, and uh, sleep issues in humans in the lab. And I'll show you a picture of the, of the new labs we've built here in Hatfield, in the Hatfield building. Um, and then there are a number of people in our group who are looking at workplace interventions uh, regard, uh, that involves sleep, 
out in the workforce. So organizational factors that improve sleep, health, and safety and performance. Some people that work on that are Ryan Olson and, and Jackie Shannon and, and Kerry Keeler, who is affiliated with our center. And then our outreach group does a lot of education on sleep and shift work. We're always getting asked what's the best shift to do for, for my workers to improve productivity. And sometimes they're interested in improving health as well. And, and we all also have outreach. Uh, I mentioned uh, Jackie Shannon earlier, but Let's Get Healthy is a program that, that she runs. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the details of that in a few minutes, because that, um, that is yielding tons and tons of data uh, that might be amenable to, to um, an informatics approach. Um, so <clears throat> I'll just highlight a couple of a couple of projects. One is Ryan Olson. Um, he's uh, doing a, a really great work in in the trucking industry. So this is that lone worker issue. And new truckers, when they first take out that job, they put on about thirty pounds in the first year, and um, it's tough to get that off because of the sedentary nature of the work. Um, and the availability of foods in trucks, truck stops, etc. But uh, so Ryan has developed a wellness and safety intervention program for truckers. Uh, it's, it has training on dietary choices, self-management, and he actually has a team competition. And that's proving very fruitful because uh, what he's found is over the first six months, they, uh, people lost eight pounds. Uh, that doesn't seem like a lot compared to the 30 pounds they may have put on in the first year, but Losing eight pounds uh, over six months is amazing, uh, but what is more amazing is that they actually continue to lose weight with this with this program. So it's not this yo-yo dieting fad. It, it's uh, he he got them to lose 18 pounds over 30 months, and now that's a NHLBI funded uh, project where he's he's trying to do this in 400 truckers. He's nearly completed that over a number of years. So and and I believe he's finding quite similar results. So that's a sort of competition-based wellness and health program. Um, and, and going back, he, he also found that, that there were reductions with this improvement in health. There were reductions in hard-breaking events in those truckers so that they, they were susceptible to uh, less danger. Um, and I imagine that that's likely related to reduction in weight, uh, reducing the amount of sleep apnea that the drivers have, and therefore improving the sleep and therefore improving the vigilance. Um, but uh, he doesn't have data on that yet. Um, so <coughs> one of the centers, as I mentioned, was called the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center. Uh, I would say this is our flagship center. It has currently five projects that they're funding. One is creating health and safety communities for home care workers. Uh, so home care workers, again, they're usually solitary workers, but they're, here they're getting together and um, having sort of group sessions on wellness and, and safety. Uh, that's again with Ryan Olson as the, as the lead. Uh, a team-based work, life, and safety for construction workers, uh, but led by Leslie Hammer at Portland State University. Kerry Keel here at um, Sports Medicine is doing health promotion to reduce health risks in correctional officers. Uh, the life expectancy of a correctional officer is only about 56 years. Uh, so if some of us in this room were corrections officers, we might be dead by now. Um, and there's uh, clearly a lot of room for improvement in the, those individuals. Of course, if you're looking after inmates, you know, 200 inmates, all of who want to escape or, uh, or do you in, it's a stressful, stressful job. That's not, it, this isn't a study of the inmates themselves who are probably undergoing even more stress, but uh, I don't know what the life expectancy of the inmates is, but, but he's doing some great work in those correctional officers. Uh, I mentioned earlier the health protection in young workers. Those are the uh, swimming pool uh, lifeguards. Um, and then training the supervisors to promote health and safety in construction. So here this is the uh, construction workers themselves, and, the, and Ken Anger is doing a project on uh, the uh, training the supervisors. And there are other pilot projects and, and an out, outreach program in that, in that center. Um, so... Um, but back to another program that, that started at Crow is uh, Let's Get Healthy with Jackie Shannon. And her mission is to partner with communities and researchers to test behavioral and lifestyle interventions at improving health, to empower people of all ages to make educated, healthy lifestyle choices and facilitate population health research and disease prevention. So in this last aspect, 
she's collecting a lot of data. Her and Lisa Marriott, I don't know if you know her, but they, they go to all these fairs, community fairs, they go to many schools uh, and some workplaces and collect data. This is what they do, they put, uh, people get a barcode wristband and they go from station to station where they learn about their uh, diet, their body composition, their blood chemistry. Some of them do genetics via wow, uh, uh, a mouthwash for DNA. They have a sleep station and a cancer, cancer risk station. You don't have to do all of them. Uh, if time permits, you can do all of them and the data gets collected into a central database and your, your, tagged, your identity is tagged. There is a possibility for prospective studies. Um, I don't think many prospective studies have, done, have happened yet, but there is a, a cross-sectional database um, which is being used by Oregon Health Authority, uh, by schools, and comparing school districts and health uh, issues across, across school districts, for instance. Uh, so that, that's uh, really a massive database. I, I think there are, you know, in the, certainly the tens and tens of thousands of, of individuals who have provided all these kind of data uh, height, weight, body fat, cholesterol, triglycerides, glucose, blood pressure, uh, activity questionnaires, sleep quality. So there's a, a data set that would be available. Um, I, of course, it's somewhat biased because it's, um, it's not a random sample of, of the population, but it's a vast, vast sample. Um, and we also have one of the biggest summer intern programs in, in the university. Uh, we have about 15 people per year. We've been, it's been going for, uh, I think, 15 to 20 years, uh, since 1995, um, 19 years, is that right? Um, and, uh, you know, we, pa we pay the students about $3,000 a year. We give the faculty member $1,000 to help with that project, and the, these summer interns or undergrads uh, really do learn a lot and help our program too. So that's a valuable uh, program. We also give numerous health and safety seminars. Uh, here's a, an example, you know, workplace aggression causes consequences in prevention, green chemistry, safer alternatives for work. Uh, last year we, we did one on sleep, sleep and shift work, impact on health, safety, and productivity. And then next week we have one on the sedentary lifestyle. So everybody sits down much more than they used to. Uh, we have people who are going to talk about do you need a standing desk, do you, should you have a walking treadmill desk, uh, should you uh, move around? So I should be moving around as I talk now. But uh, so th that's next week. It's on uh, Thursday at the um, what's that pub chain? Mac, Mac, Mac Miniman's Kennedy School um, next Thursday. You're all invited to come, but I think you have to register. So look, look it up if you're interested. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about my research. Uh, on sleep and occupational safety. This, this is an old-fashioned pen, uh, probably, and it says, moments later, Mr. Higgins fell asleep and poked both his eyes out. So it's obvious that if, if you're tired, you're in danger of peril at work. Um, but more and more, there's a recognition that it's not only these accidents that are a problem with lo loss of sleep, it's actually overall health. So here's, an, here's a cartoon that came out recently, sleep and occupational health. Well, Wally, I want you to manage our Elbonian contract programmers. You'll need to work at night because of the time difference. People who work at night have more heart attacks. Are you trying to kill me? Yes, and it's totally, totally legal. So it's sort of a flippant look at, at some of the actual problems that occur in, in our 24-hour society. And uh, this is um, the un underpinnings of our, of our bio biology, of our daily life. Uh, come from the circadian system. It, it's a system that regulates all of our physiology and our behavior. It sort of synchronizes the organs at, at the right time so that we're resting at night and, and active during the day, and we're optimally resting at night and optimally uh, active during the day. Um, and we can, of course, entrain to the environment with jet lag. You know, you, can, you get bright light, and that will reset your body clock. Um, but, you know, the problems with shift work are that you get fragmented sleep because you're trying to sleep at a time when your body's telling you to be awake. And you have increased accidents, of course. Uh, but there's also these problems that we know about which are associated with shift work. Obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and some cancers. And examples of, well, this is, uh, sorry, just a sagittal section through the brain showing where this master clock is, the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus, and the fact that it can be 
reset by bright light so that you can re, re, um, readjust. But it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't happen quickly. It takes a number of days. If you go to, from here to England, you have to sh shift by eight hours. It'll take you a week to do that. Or it could take you two weeks if you, if you reset the body clock the wrong way. Instead of shifting by eight hours, if you, if you get the light at the wrong time, you'll start shifting the wrong way. You'll have to shift 16 hours. It could take you over two weeks to, to do that. You do about an hour a day. Um, so your vacation can be messed up or your talks can be messed up because of that. Um, we'd love a way of, of shifting it quicker. Um, nothing's really available at the moment. Um, so how do we know that the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the seat of the soul? I, this is a study from 1990, but it's such a classic that I really love showing it. This is a hamster who wakes up same time almost every day. Here shown by running on a wheel, this activity here. So this is about two weeks of activity in this hamster. It's all done in dim light. So the hamster's not waking up because of the light. It's waking up because of its internal body clock. Wakes up and runs around, and that's what's registered here. You can see this, there's a slight right, right shift, so it's getting later and later each day. The period is close to 24 hours, but a bit longer, and that's similar to humans. Our body clock's slightly longer than 24 hours. If you lesion the suprachiasmatic nucleus, it becomes arrhythmic. You can see there's no pattern here. But this hamster has a, uh, a mutation that makes it have a shorter day length. So here it's waking up four hours earlier each day. It's about a 20-hour 20 20 internal body clock. And if you, take out, if you take out the suprachiasmatic nucleus of this animal and put it into this arrhythmic animal, you can make this arrhythmic animal rhythmic, but with the behavioral change behavior of this animal. So the donor, you're actually transplanting a behavior um, by transplanting 20,000 neurons from the suprachiasmatic nucleus into, this, into the right place in this, new, in this other animal. So that, that's a sort of fascinating thing, but just to underpin the anatomy. But now the importance of it, if here's, um, here's a hamster. Actually, these these hamsters have got some vulnerabilities. This one's called a cardiomyopathic hamster, so it has something wrong with its heart muscle. Uh, so meaning it's vulnerable. It doesn't live as long. But here, now this, is, this animal's studied in the light-dark cycle. And, and when it gets dark, that's when they wake up. So um, not only do you have your endogenous circadian pacemaker, but you also respond to the light-dark cycle. And so it wakes up all the time as it gets dark and runs on its wheel. But if you just simply shift the light-dark cycle, so here it's like flying uh, 12 hours, you know, flying to Taiwan and back again every week, which is what um, Bill is going to be doing soon. <laughs> um, this is what happens to the hamsters. They, they do change their behaviors, but they die sooner. We don't know why they die sooner, and we don't know if people die sooner because of if they do this kind of thing. But it just shows you that just simply shifting the, the light dark cycle can cause these adverse problems. Um, and in humans, uh, uh, shift work, for, uh, this is a massive study of 79,000 nurses. Uh, and those who report doing any shift work have an increased risk, about 20% 20, 20 increased risk to 40% increased risk of either fatal coronary heart disease, non-fatal MI, or overall coronary heart disease um, being about uh, increased odds of 40%. Uh, we don't know why. So it is, of course, uh, shift work is also associated, associated with obesity and hypertension. So these might be the underlying factors. Uh, cancer is also increased. So this is a number of different studies, which, all sh which most of them show an increased odds ratio in those people who sh do shift work for having breast cancer here and, and prost can cancer, prostate cancer here, uh, three times. Uh, odds ratio of three in this study. Um, so there's a lot of interest. You can imagine that if you shift the body clock, then you become desynchronized and all of your cells are operating at the wrong time. Your met the metabolism, every chemical reaction in the body is occurring at the wrong time. It can have um, widespread effects on all of our physiology. And that seems to be what's happening. Uh, similarly with diabetes, in those people who already have a um, a fasting glucose, which is, which is high, um, they, those who have impaired fasting glucose have a, a five times increased rate of developing full-blown diabetes if they do shift work. 
So it's, again, this, those people who are on the edge of vulnerability, then it, it pushes them over, um, this shift work. And we, we began some studies. So these are all epidemiological studies. And, I, and what's really lacking is some evidence from the lab. There's some work in, in animals. And what I've been doing is work in humans to see, try and work out some of the underpinnings of, of, of some of these changes. And an example that we do in the lab is here. We get volunteers to come in for 11 days. We put them in dim light, so they don't know what time of day it is. Um, and we record every breath they take, every brain wave, every heartbeat, their body temperature every second. Uh, we take blood every five minutes to every hour. We take their saliva samples. We take their urine samples. We do not take their fecal samples. Um, somebody's asked for that, those data, by the way. Um, and. Uh, we control their behaviors. So we tell them when to go to sleep, and we give them specific meals, and we allow them or don't allow them to do certain behaviors like exercise or, or whatever. And, and this is some of the most um, intensive physiological monitoring in humans, volunteers, of course, getting paid, um, under standardized conditions, with, um, which yields a ton of data. And, um, I'll show you an even more intricate study in a minute. But this one, what we, what we did, we, sh we shifted when they slept. So it's like that hamster, but we shifted them four hours later each, each night. So the black area is where people were allowed to sleep. In this protocol, we also woke them up every three hours because we were looking at um, lung, lung function to see if people had um, worse lung function during the during the night hours for the body clock or during sleep to understand nocturnal asthma. But in addition, we did other things. We, we, we gave them standardized meals here, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then a snack to simulate uh, what happens in real life. And we were able, when people had their breakfast at the normal time or when the people had their breakfast in the middle of the night, so after they slept here, they're going to, going to sleep about 2 p.m. sleeping till midnight and then getting up at midnight and having their breakfast at sort of 1 in the morning. This is what happens. Um, here, they're what, what I'm calling aligned. This is normal food. Uh, and this is when misaligned. And this is what happens to their glucose. Uh, all of them, or almost all of them, increase their postprandial glucose, uh, some of them to the pre-diabetic level, and one of them to the diabetic level. So if you measured you know, your fasting glucose in somebody who was a shift worker, in the middle, and you took the sample in the middle of the night, you, you may you may think that they've got diabetes, whereas they probably don't. Um, not all of these were healthy individuals. And this increased glucose was not caused by decreased insulin. It was actually in in the face of an increased insulin. Yeah. What were their corticosteroid levels? What were the steroid levels? Um, <coughs> check that. I we have the data, but I haven't. I haven't got it plotted on this kind of uh, okay, that could also aligned versus misaligned. So yeah, we have cortisol, melatonin, catecholamines um, in, in all of these. Um, so, so I'm just giving you a flavor of some of the work we do and the uh, potential availability of data that, that exists. So it's not your clinical epidemiology. This is the sort of opposite, where you have deep phenotyping um, of mechanisms in healthy, in healthy humans. Um, <coughs> and, um, <coughs> excuse me, this is, this is an example of a more intricate study. <coughs> excuse me. I'll just take a glass of water while you digest that, try and understand it. <coughs> so, <coughs> we were interested in what happens in real life to, to people who have their body clocks messed around and who have reduced sleep. Because society is beset by the problem of reduced sleep because of the 24 hours. Uh, society by sleep disorders as well. And we also study two populations, younger people and older people. Because we know that as people get older, they have less sleep. So here, <coughs> this was, uh, I think it was 37 days in the lab, no visitors, no TV, no internet, no telephone, no newspapers, no letters, um, no light, <coughs> and virtually no sleep. 
uh, we would we would interact with them. So the room is a sort of is separated from the sort of monitoring station by a double door. So we go in through the first door, we close it behind us to make sure the light doesn't go into the subject's room, and then we go into the room and say hello. We don't say good morning or good night because we don't know what time. We don't say good evening. And <clears throat> and in this experiment, we gave people the black areas of um, how much sleep they had. So before they came into the lab, by the way, we, we had them on activity monitors for three weeks to make sure they were fully aligned and replete with sleep. So they had 10 hours sleep opportunity at home every, every day, verified by telephone calls to log that they, came, that they went to bed at the right time and got up at the right time. And then when they came in the lab, we gave them 16 hours sleep opportunity per day just to make sure they had tons of sleep, so that they were not sleep deprived, because most of us in this room probably are a bit sleep deprived. We want get, to get rid of that. So we gave it the best shot. And then we reduced the amount of sleep available to them to 5.6 hours per 24 hours. And then we put them on a 28-hour day, so we shifted their body clock every day by four hours as well. So this is a combined stimulus of, um, of reduced sleep and uh, circadian misalignment. And the reduced sleep is accruing over time. So we get a really good stimulus response over time. So the sleep loss is accruing over here. And then we have a recovery sleep here. And lots of things are being measured. As I said, every brainwave, we're looking at vigilance. We're looking at sleep um, depth and responses to sleep loss when you're allowed to sleep. Uh, we, and we're looking at, and I'm looking at more of the physiology. I'm looking at the cardiovascular system and the metabolic system. And these yellow areas here, uh, where we gave standardized <coughs> meals every uh, in the in the morning and, and took blood every every minute or to five minutes to look at the glucose and insulin responses, and I'll just show you one result. Um, so it, you know nothing like this has been done before. We also compared young and old people. So older people average age was about sixty, and young people was average age was about twenty five, to see if there were differences between people, and you know, in the lab, nobody's done this, this degree of sleep loss in, in, in volunteers. If you do it, there have been lots of experiments of sleep loss in, in animals, and they've generally been total sleep loss, so like sleep deprivation. And those actually can cause death of an animal after about 12 or 13 days. Um, this is just chronic partial sleep loss, which is what a lot of us are exposed to. And this was just what we, what we found for the glucose, for instance, to the standardized meal here. Uh, this, the young people on the left and the older people in the right. The gray area is the response to this meal here um, with glucose obviously increasing and insulin increasing here. And similarly in the, in the older people on the right. And then when, we, when they had a history of this circadian uh, misalignment and sleep loss, the, the glucose response is shown in yellow here and the insulin response is shown in yellow here. So they have increased glucose and decreased insulin. This is different from what I showed you with that acute misalignment with just a, a few days. This is a few weeks. And you get, now you get uh, a different response with reduced insulin. And still, you get the, the increased glucose, which is considered a bad thing. Yeah, well, it, the 90 minutes, the, he's talking about the cycle of non-REM and REM sleep. It is approximately 90 minutes. It's not exactly, and it, and it shifts. And uh, we didn't, you know, cut down that by 90 minutes. We just cut down by an exact proportion. We tried to uh, simulate what we think is a strong stress in, in individuals. 5.6 hours of sleep opportunity per 24 hours was what we went for. It was what we thought was the largest increase which was ethical to impose for that amount of time. So um, if in that 5.6 hours, that's the only thing in our experiments which we couldn't control, which is how much sleep they had. So the body's sort of going to look after itself as much as it can, and it's going to respond by having longer bouts of deeper non-REM sleep, more slow wave sleep, and maybe more REM sleep, particularly at certain circadian phases. That just happened, and we documented it, and there's sort of dose response curves of sleep loss to this. But um, it wasn't, it's not like you can just say, cut off the last cycle, which probably did happen. 
But I think that those cycles may have lengthened because the 90-minute cycle probably lengthened a bit because of the need for sleep increased. And it be, you know the need for non-REM sleep would have increased. So in some circadian phases, you get a lot of slow wave activity. I've, I've done a study in someone with, sleep, with obstructive sleep apnea and treated them with nasal CPAP. And instead of the 90-minute cycle of non-REM REM, because they hadn't had undisturbed REM sleep for many years, probably, they went into a three-hour period of REM sleep, uninterrupted REM sleep. But this is when you're having vivid dreams, etc. I could imagine, you can only imagine what they were dreaming about, but uh, three, three hours consolidated sleep. And that was because the sleep loss has, was so great, the history of it, that accrued, and that was the rebound. So that 90-minute cycle is a general rule, but it's, it can be overcome by other means. Um, so, th so this was uh, quite an impressive finding, we, we thought, um, and similar in younger and older pe people, which was a bit of a surprise, surprise to us. And now we're looking at the cardiovascular responses uh, to, um, to this combined stimulus. So again, we have tons and tons of data. I can't analyze it all. And actually, this was collected in Boston before I came out here. So I'm um, com uh, sort of commuting uh, via Skype, et cetera, to, to try, and, try and get all this data done, uh, analyzed. So if anyone's interested in this kind of data set, um, then it may be, may be available. Um, so, uh, ten past. So, th th that was all about circadian misalignment. If you if you're doing something at the wrong body time, but going back to epidemiology, this was really what got me into the circadian field. I became very interested in why do heart attacks and strokes occur on a with a certain pattern across the day and the night. So here's two days. Actually, the data on the right are the same as the data on the left. It's just to show you the rhythmicity a bit better. Um, and this, this box area is when we normally sleep. You see stroke occurs much more frequently in the early morning here, about 9 in the morning. And so does myocardial infarction. This, uh, this also has a daily pattern with a secondary peak here in the early evening. But fewer events in the late afternoon and during the usual sleep period. Of course, people are not stressing themselves so much during, during sleep, except perhaps those with sleep apnea. Um, and that might explain why there's fewer MIs and, and actually fewer reported strokes. Uh, but you know, when, there's also clear triggers to some of these events. So getting up in the morning, changing your posture, increasing your activities, taking a coffee and in, getting into traffic, being stressed out. Uh, all of these could induce, you know, um, advert. Well, they could induce the normal physiological response, which would be an increase in sympathetic activity. But in some people, that's going to be some people who are vulnerable um, are going to be at more danger for those same normal physiological responses. So I, I wanted to also study whether there's an underlying circadian component to this. Is some of, some of this endogenous? Because if it's just the trigger, is it, if it's just what people are doing then the therapy would be, could be very different than if it's the timing of the body clock that's causing this. But it could be an interaction. So what, what I, the sort of concept is that you have this individual susceptibility. And that can potentially lead to an adverse event caused by a behavioral trigger in this individual person. But also, there may be an interaction with circadian phase. So that, that's what I wanted to study, was this sort of interaction. And an example would, of that is, if you exercise at one time a day, do you get the same response, physiological response, at a different time of day? Is there a dangerous time to exercise? Um, so again, we, we did it in the, a lab where we can control the light, a dim light. We scheduled all behaviors. And this is, you won't be able to see this very well. And I'm going to blow it up, and still you won't be able to see it very well. But uh, this is the Hatfield 10 labs that just opened this month. Uh, it's a combined epilepsy long-term monitoring EEG unit plus clinical research. So it's part of the Oak Tree Clinical Research uh, Center now. And three of the bedrooms, um, these three here, which are blown up here, uh, have been specially designed so we can do light control um, and uh, for, for our studies. So this is an example of, of a study that we, 
we did to look at the cardiovascular responses to exercise. So here's somebody on a treadmill. We got them to exercise here where the red bar is. Uh, the yellow dot is the core body temperature minimum. It's a marker of circadian phase of the body clock. Um, so uh, usually happens about 5 in the morning. Um, it gets a bit later each day, just like that hamster that was running on the wheel a little bit later each day. Our body clocks are slightly longer than 24 hours, so about 24.2 hours. Um, the body temperature just sort of marched along each day. We adjusted when people slept and when people exercised. Uh, again, it was in dim light, so the body clock ticked away at its own inherent rate. This, this yellow dot tracks the body temperature minimum or the circadian phase. And by the end of the experiment, we have exercise, shown in this red bar, at all circadian phases. And we can plot the data according to circadian phase. And this is what we find. So this is, we're taking blood, and we're taking it before, during, and after exercise. And the, the black line is before exercise, and the red line is during exercise. And we've plotted the data now for the group according to circadian phase, and we've double plotted it, so just to show the rhythmicity. So the, the data on the left are the same as the data on the right. And it's, and it's all, basically, we find out what the circadian phase is from the core body temperature, and we, and we plot the response here. So what you see is epinephrine in your blood goes up during the daytime and down during the nighttime. So the gray area is the usual time of sleep, but people are not sleeping during these studies. Um, so that's, you know, of course, across the nighttime. We call it the biological nighttime, according to the body clock. And this curly bracket is the vulnerable period when heart attacks occur. Now, this is done in healthy people. I'm trying to really find out if there's any marker that increases during this vulnerable period that could be responsible, could be caused by the circadian system or interacting with the behavior and the circadian system that might be um, a trigger for these events. And, and so baseline epinephrine goes up and down. So epinephrine is lowest during the body clock uh, nighttime when body temperature is minimum. And then, of course, if you look at this point here, exercise increases. Um, this is uh, rest and exercise. So exercise increases epinephrine. No surprise there. But the increase in epinephrine actually is double. It's double here in this vulnerable period compared to this, the nighttime. So even though the red and the black line look somewhat parallel, in actual fact, if you look at the change in epinephrine from here to here, it's twice the size of the change from here to here. So that's an example of something that is a vulnerable, uh, a potential, um, it's, a, it's an interaction between the circadian system and the behavioral system so that exercise causes a different response in the nighttime compared to the daytime. You know, that uh, has implications for shift workers, but it might have implications for when heart attacks occur. So if you have a much more increased circulating epinephrine, um, then you might get a much more robust sympathetic discharge and, um, and response. And in vulnerable people, this may have a, uh, an impact on the, um, on the pathology. So that's the type of studies we do. Um, we not only look at epinephrine, we look at norepinephrine and cortisol, and we look at parasympathetic activity from heart rate variability data. And, and of note, at the same time of vulnerability, this is when you get the greatest withdrawal of parasympathetic activity when you exercise. So not only are you getting the greatest change in sympathetic, you're getting the greatest change in parasympathetic. So it's this balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. Um, the sympathovagal balance is uh, greatly affected in that vulnerable period and might be, might be important. And so we looked at many other blood factors. We looked at platelet activation. This is the vulnerable period now, shown in red. We saw cortisol peaking then. We saw platelet activation peaking then. We, we saw a fibrinolytic inhibitor um, also peaking just before the vulnerable period. So these are uh, blood clotting um, or antifibrinolytic uh, factors, these two, which might predispose to a, a blood clot formation of thrombus and, and a MI in vulnerable people at that time. Um, we saw sympathetic, the rate of change of sympathetic activity during exercise was highest, and the rate of change of heart rate was highest, but the peak sympathetic activity occurred later than this in this vulnerable period. 
And surprisingly, we found blood pressure to be actually lowest in this vulnerable period. This is opposite to what we predicted. Um, and this is showing the greatest change in parasympathetic nervous system activity. So it's more than one variable that's going to cause your heart attack. Um, we're not exactly sure what it is. This is healthy people we studied. But I, I just wanted to show you the kind of data that we've been collecting. And I will be continuing to collect in the new, new labs that have opened up here. Um, coming up. I thought I'd show you one, one, one more example of a very, very interesting finding from a similar study. So not only did we look at exercise, we, we wanted to look at postural change. Um, because, and postural change can be just standing up from, from, bed, from the bed, but um, we wanted to do it in a standardized way. So we, instead of standing up, we put them on a tilt table and we increased their, uh, their height and we looked at their physiological responses to changes in posture. Um, and some of them fainted or began to faint. And this is somebody, uh, of course, at the British uh, changing of the guards in front of Buckingham Palace um, who fainted, partly because they're standing there in this heavy uniform with, and they can't, you have to, if you, if you don't move, you, you don't have the increase in venous return you have to like contract your muscles in your legs to pump the blood back up to the heart. If you don't do that enough, um, and they're trained to do that, by the way, now, to just sort of move imperceptibly, uh, to, then, then you could faint. And if it happens during the rehearsal for the, for the Trooping of the Color, guess what happened on the Trooping of the Color? There he goes. <laughs> um, and it doesn't only happen in England. This was the Queen's birthday in 2010, but it doesn't only happen in England. It also happens in Denmark. Um, the, the common theme, as you see, is the hats, right? So we know why they have those furry hats now. It's because of this, to protect themselves when they fall over. But um, So this was the tilt table test. And, and if you look at blood pressure, the, the teal er, shaded areas when we tilted them up to 60 degrees, and this is where we tilted them down. And this is blood pressure beat by beat. You see for about uh, two or three minutes, relatively stable, about 120 beats, uh, millimeters of mercury. And it it's remains stable during the tilt up. And then, but unfortunately for this person, it just plummeted here, just went way down. And heart rate went down as well. The response to a decrease in blood pressure should be an increase in heart rate. But they're decompensating. They decrease their heart rate with a decrease in blood pressure. And that's when you get a dry mouth. You say, hmm, I don't feel so well. I'm about to faint. And we're, mo we're monitoring the blood pressure. So we're going to tilt the table down anyway. But the, we're looking at symptoms as well. So uh, we tilted it down. Uh, we also look at cardiac output. That went down. Um, stroke volume went down. So we tilt them down. So, But the interesting thing was these were people healthy people who didn't have any autonomic problems. And this was happening in half the people. Not all of them, but half the people. But when it happened, it was quite striking. It only happened during the biological night. So most people are not exposed to post, you know, tilt table tests in the middle of the night. Probably we're the only people that's ever done it. And we've, we think we've uncovered a vulnerability in people who do stand up during the middle of the night, elderly people who have the insomnia, they're susceptible to falls. They're susceptible to, to fainting. Um, and, and it might be that we, we've uncovered this danger that, um, and possibly one of the reasons. But, but that's, the, that's just, to me, it shows the real importance of the circadian system. Or not, not necessarily the importance, but the, the potential effect of the circadian system on, on our physiology. Um, and not only does it affect my, myocardial infarction, which, as I alluded to earlier, asthma symptoms occur more at nighttime. So we've studied you know, whether nocturnal asthma occurs at nighttime. Is it because people are asleep at night? Is it because they're lying down at night? Is it because they're exposed to dust mites in their bedding at night that increase allergens? And, and, or is it because of the body clock time? So with these intricate protocols, we can separate those out. And the similar, we did studies on, on epilepsy. I'll just show you the asthma data. Here we found that in, when, we, when we had people with asthma in the lab, they had a, a, 
a nice robust circadian rhythm in, in pulmonary function and airways resistance with worse resistance or highest resistance of the airways during the usual sleep period um, caused by the circadian system, not by sleep. There's a separate effect of sleep, so they add up. If you're sleeping at night in asthma, you're going to get an increase in resistance because you're asleep, and you're going to get an increase in resistance because your body clock is, a, is asleep. Is, it's the night for the body clock. Those two add up um, and cause worse asthma at nighttime. And lo and behold, if you look at when the patients with asthma take their medications, when they're in this, la when they're in this lab situation, they don't know what time of day it is, but they do take their medications much more frequently during the nighttime than during the daytime, even though they don't know when the nighttime and the daytime is. So th this shows the clinical importance of the, of the circadian system. Um, so in summary, I showed you that endogenous circadian rhythm, rhythms occur in all organs, tissue, well, I didn't talk about tissues and cells, but they do. Uh, I showed that dis circadian disruption affects health and that some diseases are affected by circadian rhythms themselves. And an example would be worse asthma at night um, and possibly cardiac events, although we haven't studied that in, in a patient group. And most of the work was done at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Uh, and actually, this photograph was taken when I was receiving a mentoring award. So this is my wife. <laughs> this is me. Uh, uh, this is my um, PhD supervisor who was visiting from London, and he died a month ago. Abe Guz is a great guy, and we've just been writing all of the um, sort of obituaries to the Journal of Physiology in London, and it's bringing back all of his mentors are sending in stories of, of, of him. Um, what a great guy. But these are the, the main people that worked on this, on this project. Frank Shear, he's now running the unit I used to run in London. Kun Hu is visiting next week. <clears throat> he, he may be of interest to some of you because all of the activity monitoring that was done and all of the heartbeat monitoring that was done in all of these experiments are being analyzed by him. So he is sort of our bioinformatics guy in Boston. And he, I've invited him out to give a talk on Friday, the, I think it's June the 13th. Um, so I'll send that to Bill and he can circulate it because he, he looks at the sort of self-similarity of the data. He's looking at fractal patterns of activity rhythms and finding quite astonishing things about how our activity is regulated over short times. It's very similar to how it's activate, uh, co um, controlled over much longer periods. And some of that is related to circadian rhythmicity. That's not only activity he looks at, but also heart, uh, heart rate. And he has data sets in outside. He has huge data sets in in people with Alzheimer's and activity um, and um, with interventions such as light. So I think that his sort of um, mathematical approach might be of interest to you all. So that's Kuhn Hu, and I'll send that invitation around. So I should stop there with five minutes for questions. Thanks. Bill. So, um I, um, one thing that I, I think about, you know, whenever you um, do, you know, experiments in controlled settings is whether anything you do that's, like, abnormal, like locking people in the room for 11 days or something yeah. like that, um, has any possible, you know, confounding effects on, on, on your measurements or things like that. I don't even know if there's any way to test that, but yeah. um, do you ever think about that? Or? I, no, I... We do think about it, then we ignore it. No, it's, um, it's you've hit on a, a slight problem with our studies, and that is we generally don't have a control group that doesn't do anything, that would stay in the lab for 37 days and we don't do anything. Um, so we try and get around that and say, look, we're, we're looking at the same people, and the only thing we're changing is when we do things. So. And then we plot everything according to circadian phase. But the way we can sort of look at that is if we look at the, the first week and the second week and the third week. And whenever we've looked at the, the overall first week and the overall second week and the overall third week, they're the same. So there's nothing that is changing because of the environment that, that is different across those weeks. And we, so we think that the environment itself uh, doesn't impose a, a, new, you know, a new stress. But we do, we include in most of our analyses uh, a factor called, you know, time into study. 
So we have circadian phase as a factor. We have um, time into the day length as a factor. And we have day into the study as a factor. So that would sort of control for any linear changes across time. You know, there may be changes immediately come in because diet changes. You know, pe people, um, what are they, uh, they have saltier diets at home. And when they come into the lab, there's less salt. Um, so with less salt, they lose a bit of weight. Water, they lose a bit of fluids. But that happens over two days. And then, then it stabilizes. So we don't always have great controls. Um, but the, la the latest program project grant that they have at, at Boston does have a control group where nothing happens. And, it, and that will be interesting data. Do you need someone watching them all the time? Are people likely to just kind of nod off in the middle of the yeah. portions where they're supposed to be working? Yeah, so we have people, um, they're on camera the whole time, and it's not recorded. Um, and we turn the cameras off when they go to the back, because they also have to you know, urinate into a bottle. And um, well, there is a bathroom in there. Um, but so we, they're, wa they're watched all of the time. Uh, for what's called a constant re routine protocol, another way of looking at circadian rhythms is to put someone in a bed, not let them move or sleep, and just look at their physiology change over a 24-hour period. And then, then we have we actually have the people in the room with them all the time, you know, talking to them, playing chess or draughts. Not so much poking, um, but particularly that's important for my cardiovascular responses. No, no, but. One interesting observation is the older people, you know, the people that we have doing that are sort of interns, and young interns from the uni local university. And they are also susceptible to fall asleep. And it turns out that they're more susceptible to fall asleep than the older participants who are, and sometimes you get the participant waking up the technicians. <laughs> There's a question at the back. Is the uh, OHSU sleep lab down at the residence inn in the waterfront, is that part of your group? No. No. The, uh, we interact. We go to seminars together. And um, we need to increase that interaction because uh, for our overall occupational health center, you know, s diagnosing sleep disorders in the workplace is something that I want to I do. Um, but they're a separate group. Okay, thanks.